Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm Andrea Pirro. I'm the director of the Visiting Artists Program at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And I'm delighted to welcome you to this evening's lecture by visiting designer Fernando LaPaz. Tonight's program is presented in partnership with SAC's Department of Architecture, Interior Architecture, and Designed Objects and the UIC School of Design Public Seminar Series with additional support provided by the Illinois Arts Council Agency. Each year, SAC's Visiting Artists Program hosts a variety of public talks by internationally recognized artists, designers, and scholars to expand our thinking about contemporary art and culture. In addition to public programs, guests meet with students through a variety of engagements. And yesterday, we had the unique opportunity to bring students from SAC and UIC together for a lively session with Fernando LaPaz. It's an honor to have Fernando visit SAC and UIC, and I would like to thank him for sharing his work and expertise with us this evening. I would also like to thank my colleagues at UIC for their partnership on this event and for hosting us yesterday. Before the lecture begins, I just have a couple quick notes. If you could please silence your cell phones and note that video recording of the talk is not permitted. At the end of the presentation, we'll have time to take a few questions from the audience before the program concludes by 7.30. Please raise your hand if you have a question and our staff will circulate microphones for your use. If you are posing a question, we do ask if you could just please keep it concise so we can get to as many questions as time allows. So thank you again for joining us tonight. And now I welcome to the podium Tim Persons, Professor and Chair of the Designed Objects Program at SAC to introduce Fernando LaPaz. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce Fernando Lapos. The history of object design has typically been written as a chronological series of movements, arts and crafts, modernism, radical design, postmodernism, minimalism. But we can also think about it in terms of what has been centered. When the profession of industrial design was born out of the Industrial Revolution, it centered profit. It took about 100 years for the industry to begin to accept that perhaps the health of the end user should be taken into account and that people should be centered. But which people? The average person, obviously, who can walk here and have 2020 vision. It took another 50 years before the idea gained traction that design should include people of all abilities rather than disenfranchising anyone with any kind of impairment. Today, human-centered design is taught in virtually every school and sold by consultancies worldwide. But we only have to say two words, climate crisis, <laughs> to understand that anything human-centered now needs to be critiqued and rethought. In her book, Low Tech, Designed by Radical Indigenism, Julia Watson states that in an era of both utopian high-tech and unprecedented climate extremes, we are drowning in information while starving for wisdom. Watson proposes a movement to rebuild an understanding of indigenous philosophy and vernacular architecture that generates sustainable, climate-resilient infrastructures. Fernando Lapos is one of a new generation of designers whose work shows how designed objects can center the planet and our non-human kin while protecting vulnerable communities. Fernando was born in Paris, France in 1988 to Mexican parents and was brought up in France and Mexico before studying design at Central St. Martin's College in London. His work transforms humble, natural materials into refined design pieces sold through his galleries Friedman Bender and Sarah Myerscuff and exhibited and collected by major museums around the world. But to me, what makes Fernando's work special is beyond the object, in the network of connections he generates within his projects, working with a seed bank, collaborating with farmers, training community members, all the things we don't traditionally think of as design. By creating this ecosystem, the objects transcend their seductive aesthetic and become potent symbols of the political, economic, and environmental challenges that we face. So please join me in welcoming Fernando Lapos.
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining me tonight. Uh, it's a real pleasure being here. Um, and I'll jump straight into it because I think we have to go through quite a number of slides. <laughs> um, so, yes, I'm Fernando. I studied product design in Central St. Martins. Uh, product design meaning, you know, quite traditional industrial design, very focused on packaging, on consumer products, high production levels loads of plastic. Um, and so, you know, I think over the last decade or so, I've had to sort of keep some things, but unlearn a lot of things that um, came with my industrial design education. I like to think that now I focus more on what I can call a material design, but I also do social design, uh, and I'm really interested in agriculture. Um, I would also describe myself as both a designer and an artisan. Uh, as my pieces are very, very labor intensive and um, the, the way I usually like to work is by developing sort of new craft myself that then I can teach to other people to replicate. So every single piece that goes through my studio um, goes through my hands in one way or another. Um, so that's why I also like to consider myself an artisan or a craftsperson. Um, I'm also really interested in this idea of the tension between the local and the global. Um, and this has to do not only with my interests, but also where I have been situated. Um, I spend my time between London, Mexico City, and a very small indigenous community called Tonawixla, which is what I'll start this presentation with. Um, so Tonawixla is an indigenous farming community uh, the, in the state of Puebla in the south of Mexico. And something that's really interesting is that it is situated about 80 kilometers from the oldest archaeological site that evidences the beginnings of corn domestication. We're really talking at the birthplace of corn. This is where all the corn of the world started. Um, it's also really amazing because it's essentially a desert. It's super, super dry. So it's a desert that was turned into an oasis of, of food and abundance by the Mixtecs, the indigenous people of this area. Um, this is a sort of, uh, yeah, like an image of just how drastically the, the transformation from what's called teosinte, or our wild corn, has been into, you know, what is now corn. Basically, it's estimated about 7,000 years ago, an ancient Mesoamerican found a mutant teosinte, you know, a hermaphrodite teosinte that could self-pollinate, that had an, an overabundance of the, of the female uh, traits, which are the grains. And this ancient person uh, decided that was interesting, took a grain, planted it, and started to reproduce uh, this one strain. And by doing that, kicked off, uh, you know, thousand years, thousands and thousands of years of selective breeding process that gave us the great diversity of a corn that we have today. But it all started really, really close to San Oixla in the, in the caves of Tehuacan. So I had the pleasure of arriving in Tono Wixla and meeting Tono Wixla because of this friendship with this man called Delfino. Delfino is someone that was working in my dad's bakery when I was a kid. My dad really trusted him and his wife and basically you know, was like, well, it's a lot cheaper to send them with Delfino in the summer camps, uh, you know, in the summer to, than to summer camps. So, so me and my sister uh, started to going to Tona Wixla as, as children um, with the care of Delfino and his family. And I think that was uh, quite a, a marking experience for me because, uh, you know, being sort of an urban child from Mexico City, uh, it was for the first time that I started to realize that Mexico has just such a diversity of people, you know, and I'm not talking only ethnically, but also in terms of, uh, you know, how differently they live their lives. Uh, these are people that speak a different language, Mixteco, you know, it's not even Spanish. Uh, eat differently, um, have different traditions, uh, and something that really struck me is, you know, that all the fruits and the vegetables look differently from, you know, the markets in Mexico City. Um, so, for example, these are some of the corns that we grow there, uh, and as you can see, it has all these wonderful colors. It has, you know, nothing to do with, with the, you know, orange and, and, and sorry, the yellow industrial corn. Um, and this, this, uh, this variety of corn and this sort of genetical, uh, uh, 
yeah, wealth that we have is because of the discovery of what was called the milpa system. Um, so remember, corn is this sort of man-made plant. It's like a freak of nature that has an abnormal consumption of nitrogen. So if you're just planting corn, corn basically kills the land. You, 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 you can't just plant corn over and over and over. You have to combine it with other plants. And the ancient Mesoamericans found this. And so what they developed was um, what's called also the, the three holy sisters, uh, where three plants work together, corn, beans, and squash. Uh, the beans basically use the corn as a, as a structure to climb up and get sunlight to protect their, their grains from insects as well because they're high. But then through the roots, they have these little nodules that fix nitrogen back into the soil from the air, uh, essentially fixing nitrates into the ground. Um, nitrates are essentially the main uh, ingredient in commercial fertilizers. So what you have is a plant that is already fertilizing the soil for the other plants. Uh, the pumpkins or the squash, what they do is they start to, to grow really fast, they start to carpet the floor, um, and they create like a layer of leaves that, that block the soil from sunlight, that prevents weeds from growing, but also keeps humidity in the soil. So in really uh, dry areas like this, only with the morning dew you have enough humidity for all the plants to keep living. So this, this interconnection of these three plants is an amazing example of indigenous technology uh, of permaculture that was discovered about 5,000 years ago. It's a system that survived, you know, the Spanish conquest, uh, the early 20th century, um, and it's a, it's a system that unfortunately now is at odds of disappearing because it's a system that, you know, you cannot mechanize. You can't run a big tractor through a milpa system. You have to do it by hand. A milpa plantation looks more like a garden uh, as opposed to a monoculture um, yeah, field. And so we have to think about what are the, the, the stark contrasts between uh, architecture, uh, sorry, agriculture practiced by communities like this where these plants are still considered sacred plants, where you have this very careful balance between all these plants and you have more like gardens compared to how corn is planted in the rest of the world. Um, corn is basically hardly considered a food nowadays. Corn is m the most planted grain in the world, but most of it is planted to produce secondary uh, products like you know, uh, sugars for, for uh, processed foods, ethanol, biofuels, animal feed, um, and bioplastics, which I think is a really, really silly thing to do. Um, <laughs> and I'm you know, open for discussions later. Um, but this, this, basically, this massive collision between the two philosophies of agriculture uh, happened in Mexico in 1994, after Mexico signed the, the North American Free Trade Agreement with the United States and Canada. This is what really sort of flipped agriculture on its head in Mexico. Uh, because all of a sudden we were trading and competing with uh, places like Iowa where, you know, I mean, the, just the amount of corn that is produced there is, is, is impossible to compete with. So this crashed the, the market in Mexico, and the only way to sort of, you know, join these international markets was to uh, make mega plantations that are super uh, effective, super profitable, instead of the family-owned small farms, which was the bulk of the production of Mexico. So this is, um, this is Delfino, uh, you know, a couple of decades later, uh, explaining um, what this big shift cost in his community. And I like to always, uh, every time I go around, I always have a camera, and I, I'm always doing interviews, and you'll see a lot of interviews, because for me it's important that you hear these things directly from them. Uh, so this is a short video of Delfino who is now a community leader in Tona Wixla. Lo más triste también es de que nosotros lo que cultivamos aquí tampoco ya no se puede vender. Nos dicen que, que es mejor el maíz que viene de la industria, que el maíz de acá pues este no pesa mucho y la gente pues es, ya no quiere cultivar. Ya no quiere trabajar, mejor se va. Yo recuerdo que se cultivaba y había mucha tierra fértil. Pero desde el momento que vino, vino la industria de fuera, ya vino a cambiar todo. Todos los químicos que se le aplica a la planta, al maíz, al frijol, 
vino a erosionar también la tierra. Ya veo que en vez de árboles o tierra para cultivar, hay piedras. Aquí están creciendo las piedras en vez de árboles. Pero ya nos dimos cuenta que ese químico nos está afectando y por eso decidimos cambiar. So I think, you know, in Mixteco, Mixteco is a lovely language. It it's, uh, has nothing to do with Spanish. It has maybe more things in common with Asian languages. So there's a lot of metaphors about nature. And, and I love that there's no word for erosion in Mixteco. So when he's translating and speaking in Spanish, uh, you know, sometimes you get these wonderful phrases like, you know, here we have grow, uh, rocks growing instead of trees, uh, which I think is a very powerful image. Um, so for me, it's really, really interesting to see how global market changes can affect sustenance farmers, basically farmers that were not really involved in any trading, that were growing just for their own consumption. Um, and this has, you know, devastating ecological and social uh, consequences. So uh, this is an interview with Esmeralda, who is one of the, the ladies that work in the, in the community workshop that we established in Tona Wixla. Um, I thought she was the most sort of relevant person to talk about the migration effect because she actually lost a couple of her brothers that, that, that died crossing the border, and, and I think her testimony is, is, uh, is quite a strong one. Hay veces que hay años que no ves a tus hijos, hijos que se van a Estados Unidos a trabajar y simplemente este, en el camino pierden la vida. Y sería muy bonito que el día de mañana hubiera un trabajo, hubiera un, una estabilidad para nosotros, para que también nosotros no tengamos esa necesidad de buscar algo económico en otro lugar. La mujer se dedica a estar en, en, en la casa, a cuidar los niños, no tiene un, un papel este, relevante, digamos, porque nunca aportamos algo económico. So I think for me, this project is also about humanizing migration. I think, uh, you know, the majority of the Mexican migrants that, that come to the United States um, are indigenous rural migrants, actually. And they are certainly not escaping violence. They are not chasing the American dream. You know, not, none of these people want to come to get a Lamborghini. Um, I think they are rather victims of a global system which is incompatible with their traditional lifestyle. And when these communities get exposed to this sort of unchained uh, exposure to capitalism, it's where you have effects like this, you know, uh, whole ecocides that result in such a severe consequence in the land that they use for living that they have no choice but to migrate. So my challenge was, you know, how can we bring corn back without following the conventional model of extracting these very precious seeds to sell to fancy restaurants in Mexico City or in New York or whatever, you know? Um, because I think this, this is perpetuating this kind of cycle of extractivism where you just take things and sell it for more money, you know, even if you pay them correctly. I don't, I don't see that as, as an interesting model. Um, so I saw an opportunity in, in, in working with the leaves of these corn. So, so what's really impressive about these varieties is that that color that is present in the grain is also present in the leaves. And, um, and it's amazing, you know, you just have, you never know, it's like, I describe it almost like, a, like opening a present every time you open one of these cups. You know, every, every leaf, every layer has a different pattern, has a different color, uh, the variety is just, it's just endless. Um, and so, for me, uh, I started to look at techniques like marquetry, where, you know, by using sort of, in a way, the limitation of the size of the leaf, you can create smaller pieces that fit together as a jigsaw puzzle, but that together start to become a new surface, a continuous surface. Um, but again, you know, the, the, the pattern starts to kind of disappear because of, uh, because of all the, the variety of color. Let's say if that was just black and white, you could tell the pattern like straight away, but it, it's a, it gets a little bit lost because of, the, of, the, of all the, the variety. Um, so yeah, it's a simple process. It's, it's just ironing it, uh, backing it with paper, you know, and pressing it and, and holding it together with tape. Uh, we try to use, you know, the most sort of natural glues. We use a lot of latex, contact glues, um, hide glues. You know, we try to be as, as uh, logical with, with our adhesives as with the rest of the, of the process. Uh, so we make everything from furniture to also mosaics that can be applied directly to walls to make wall coverings for interiors. Uh, we can back it with cork, for example, uh, for soundproofing. 
So it's a system where you know these these mosaics are now completely done in, in the workshop in the in the countryside, and you know we just send them um, FedEx barcodes and these get shipped like all over the place. So so it's a it's a way of also centralizing the production within their their community and and not having them you know travel or or leave their communities to 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 make this production. Um, but I think the the big challenge for me, uh, besides from making the material, was to create a working system. And, and this came when we started to collaborate all together. So the collaboration of the, of the project is essentially myself as a designer, the community of farmers, and the world's largest seed, seed bank uh, that counts with the largest collection of uh, maize, corn, uh, germplasms. So, I mean, seed varieties, basically, from all over the world. This is a foundation that started in the 1950s. They have two refrigerated vaults, you know, state of the art. And uh, what we did essentially is uh, we started to talk to them and we started to receive uh, seed stock uh, that was collected between the 60s and the 70s around the area of Tonawixla uh, to reintroduce all of these seeds that were lost after, after the 90s. Uh, so how does the project work? We, we have created a new source of revenue with the husks. Uh, this incentivizes the farmers to reintroduce these native corns with the seeds that we provide to them. Um, and, you know, this, this new sort of uh, microeconomy is what, what gives them the push to not have to stress out about competing with... Uh, with industrial grains. And I think something that is also really important is that uh, this new system, because you're creating a new system from scratch, uh, you can also target, uh, you know, the, now the biggest demographic of the town because most of the men migrated uh, and the women were left behind with the children. So, so what we are doing is we're really focusing on the women um, so that they can come and work in, in the workshops while still be able to take care of their families. And, and this is a, a new source of, of, of income that the women didn't have. Um, for me, it's really important to work with women because women are the educators of, of the families. You know, women are the ones that are going to carry these ideas to the next generation more, more so than men. So, so it's been a really uh, you know, nice sort of dynamic to, to also work with the women and, and, and have them be almost ambassadors of the project with the rest of the community. So the results of the project so far is uh, we have reintroduced about eight species of native maize, uh, some with the seeds of the seed bank, some uh, because the farmers are now engaged in the project and they have you know, come up with uh, seeds that people were saving. Um, we have this partnership with the seed bank. Uh, we built a communal composting system. So basically everyone gathers all their vegetable waste and uh, communally turns them into um, compost and fertilizers with worm, like worm humus and things like that. And this is a, a communally owned uh, facility. Um, the, we work with the local school, I mean, with a few children that are left. Um, and we create flexible employment. I say flexible because the whole point is to not turn this into a factory either, you know. So when people want to work, they can come and work. Uh, and I think probably the, the biggest success is that we have returned to the milpa system. So most of the farmers in the community are now practicing the milpa uh, again. And I think for me, um, it's, it's really nice to see how design can really create value. Uh, it's, I, I think for me, you know, um, I mean, I see a lot of designers uh, thinking that collectible design is about using, or luxury design is using a, you know, a big slab of marble and putting brass in it. But if you work like that, the, the material is already doing half of the work. So for me, for me I think uh, it's, it's a real challenge and, and a real opportunity to sort of flex your design muscles when you're working with something that is worthless, you know, and then you turn it into something that, that generates revenue. So one square meter of Totomoxle makes farmers uh, the same revenue than a, a ton and a half of grain. Uh, you know, so this is only using, you know, three or four cobs uh, as opposed to, you know, their whole parcel, basically. So this has really offered uh, this financial independence from a market in which traditional farmers always lose. And I think it's important to note that this community was not a community of craftsmen uh, uh, or craftspeople, sorry. Um, 
they're farmers. So by creating this new craft and teaching it to the people, um, you're creating also not only a new craft, but a new generation of, of craftspeople. Um, and a lot of the design process over the last nine years, we started the project in 2015, so it's nine years this year, has been about uh, creating a production system, a system of methodology, of procedures, of order of operations, of tools that allows anyone in the community to become a new craftsperson uh, with Toto Moxley in only a matter of days and to produce results at the same level as someone that has been there for, for years, you know. So this ensures, you know, quality for, for, for my pieces. We, we, we have very few uh, quality control mistakes. The, the whole system is, is, is very low tech, is, is, is very repairable, uh, but very precise as well. You know, we use cutting dies that are, you know, laser embedded. Um, silk printing, uh, screen printing to, to guide them into gluing it in the right place and then that registers for a cutting die that, you know, cleans the edges, etc., etc. So it's a hybrid between a, a mechanized production and a very craft-based production. And I think, you know, thinking of, 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 of well, talking about design thinking, uh, which we were talking today with Tim, um, yeah, I think it's, it's also really interesting to kind of uh, turn design thinking on its head because design thinking has been mostly about urban contexts, you know, and, and so what about a rural design thinking? I, I think for me what has really allowed me to, to, to think as of design solutions for these, for these issues in, in, in the countryside is, is by being there, you know, by being present. I, I have been part of every single harvest since 2015. And, you know, you start to, to see little things where that can be improved. So, for example, the, the object on, on your right is a, is a sort of DIY furniture machine that we made where you have a circular blade that they just, like, you know, scoop the, the corner around to make a perfect cut at the bottom to separate the leaves really, really easily before they were using, like, a little knife and it would take forever. So these, these things, you know, are, 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 are all tools and solutions that, that we have come up with together by working together, and, 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 and this is something that you have to do that. You, you can't do that at a distance from, from the city, you know. You have to spend some seasons there. So I think, uh, for me, it's also about encouraging families to be involved in every step of the production chain, from growing the corn to working in the, in the workshop. Um, and, and I think this is really about also capturing um, all of these families that are returning migrants. This was a big shift, actually, that we saw during the pandemic. Because if you, if you think about it, all of the people that you know, were working in restaurants, I mean, it's no secret that most of the restaurants in, in, in the States and in Canada are operated by, by Mexicans, really. You know? And so when all these restaurants closed down, these people had no jobs, they had no furlough because they're, they're there illegally. Uh, so there was a really big sort of reverse migration towards Mexico and during the pandemic. And the town almost doubled their, their population because of this. So I, I saw that as a real opportunity also to, to utilize the skills of, of these people that have been trained in the United States that have also a different mentality, uh, but are, that are longing to not come back, you know, to, to stay in their town again. And so uh, I think this couple are, are, are one of the best examples, you know, as you can see by their hats, they're like big baseball fans and, you know, they lived in, in the States for more than 15 years. Their, their children are actually American, but the whole family moved back and, uh, and they're one of the key couples that sort of manages the, the workshop now. But they're also farmers. Um, so, so it's really nice to see people that you know, where some of our best farmers, that's, an, that's another thing, we lost some of our best farmers to, you know, for them to come and be farmers here. So it's really nice to have people come back and be farmers again. Um, so why does Tona Wixla matter? Why should you here in Chicago be, be, be concerned about what's happening in Tona Wixla? And I think, I think you should all be interested in this because this is a, a sort of diagram that I found in National Geographic which shows the massive decline in the diversity of the agricultural crops that took tens of thousands of years to develop. Uh, and we have lost, you know, about more than 80% in, in just one century, you know. So, so all of these things that are 
a wealth of biodiversity, but also of culture, it's, it's just being eradicated in such a fraction of time, such a short fraction of time. And, and when you go to a supermarket, you might see it and you might, you might think of, like, wow, this is like a, a place of abundance of food. But really what you're looking at is, is a total desert of biodiversity. You know, we're eating one or maybe two varieties of each crop where there are hundreds to be, to be used. And it's really important to preserve this diversity because this is going to be another sort of tool in the arsenal of solutions that we have to have for the future climate change. And we're already seeing this in the community. For example, these, these varieties that, that we have reintroduced are a lot more drought resistant than the commercial ones. So especially in the last three years where we had unprecedented droughts, the few farmers that were still planting industrial corn had total losses. Uh, but the, the farmers that are part of the, of the program, yeah, they didn't have great years, and maybe some of the varieties didn't work, but if you're planting eight of them, you know, two or three can survive, and even, even if you don't have a massive harvest, you can eat, you know. So, so this is already uh, proving very important, and, and you never know. These seeds, you know, that are in Mexico, that are preserved and kept in Mexico, might have the solution for droughts in Africa or in the Middle East. Um, so it's very, very important to preserve that. So I'm going to jump to sort of my next uh, project, which is also uh, related to Tona Wixla, and it's uh, working with agave. And, and agave is very important for the other big problem of Tona Wixla, and you're going to see that in a second. Um, so I'll start with this little video of, of how I work with agave. I really like working with agave. It's such a fantastic plant. Nowadays, it's mostly used to make tequila and their leaves are just thrown away, which is a shame because you can make fibers from them. It's actually quite simple. You just have to beat them and scrape the leaves. When the fibers are washed and dried, they turn to a lovely blonde color. These fibers are called sisal, and for centuries, they were considered the best material for making ropes and fishing nets. But unfortunately, the invention of plastics put most sisal growers out of business. It's hard to find rosagel nowadays. I personally like to leave the fibers loose. They really feel like hair. I actually sometimes like to call it vegan horse hair. <laughs> yeah, so it's, I mean, it's a, it's a wonderful material. Um, it's something that, yeah, was typically used for, for making threads and, and, and weaving it, but I, I like this sort of rawness of the material when, it, when it's like hair, so... Um, so that's how I, I, I just basically use very simple knots for, for most of my pieces. Uh, I mean, this, is, this, was, sorry, this was one of the, the first examples. This is a video from, I think, 2016. So uh, we've come a long way since then. Uh, the, the pieces are a lot more fine now, um, which also shows how, you know, uh, you, you get better at your craft and you get better at every step of, of the whole thing, uh, from farming to processing the fibers to working with the fibers. And, and you can see them in the pieces that are, are a lot more refined. Um, I sometimes use the fibers natural, but I also dye them. Uh, this is dyed with cochineal. Cochineal is a, is a wonderful pigment, an indigenous secret as well, that basically allowed the Spanish to start uh, trading with China. China had the secret of the silkworms, and the Spanish, by uh, conquering the Zapotecs, got the secret to the, the reddest red, basically, and that's, that's what kicked off the, the, the commerce between Spain and China. I could do a whole presentation on cochineal, I'm not going to, but essentially it's a bug that grows in the prickly pear cactus, and you can make uh, really, really, really strong uh, pinks, reds, purples, oranges, and so that's uh, one of the, first, uh, the main pigments that I use. Uh, this is a big installation that I did, um, I was a designer in residence for Design Miami in, in 2019, and this was a really ambitious uh, installation that covered all of the design district in Miami with this sort of slots and hammocks that would be hanging all over the, the district. It was a really nice project of, you know, just getting basically the whole town involved uh, for, for, for two or three months, uh, weaving every day. Um, a, a true feat of uh, organization and craftsmanship, in my opinion. Um, I also make bigger sculptures, uh, monsters. I'm sort of inspired as well by a lot of these sort of traditional uh, dance costumes in, in Mexico, in Africa, in Bulgaria. Um, 
Uh, but then, then I take it also to, to furniture, you know. So for example, this is a, a, a closet. Uh, I've made sofas. But again, you know, I, I still uh, design like a designer. I still use my computer. I use Rhino. You know, I, I have a CNC cutter in my studio. Uh, so we have this sort of precision that technology brings you. But then I like to hide the technology. I don't, I don't like for people to tell that it was cut with a CNC. Um, so these are short clips of, of how we work. Uh, it's essentially close to latch hooking. It's an insane amount of work, you know, strand by strand. Um, and also, for example, all the upholstery we do in the studio. We do everything in the studio. So, so um, that also allows you to test things that no upholsterer will ever want to do, or they will charge you like so much, you know. So, so I think. You know, for everyone, anyone that is um, thinking of starting their own personal practice, I think it's, it's an amazing uh, freedom to have to do things yourself and to make mistakes and to approach things uh, sort of naively, you know, and watch a lot of YouTube to try and figure out the things that you need and, and, and not learn the things that you don't need um, because that, that allows you to make you know, things that, that most people wouldn't try if they're just running a business, you know, like, like an upholsterer will never spend two weeks trying to figure this out, you know, so, uh, so try it yourself. <laughs> uh, yeah, these are some details of the, the handles in the closet, reminiscent of where the material comes from, you know, the agave leaf. But uh, like I said, agaves are, are very important for the other big problem of Tona Wixla. And, and um, I sort of came up with agaves because when I had this re-encounter with Delfino, this was after maybe not seeing Delfino for 10 years, you know, I went back to Tana Wixla uh, once I had my, my Totomoxle material after I did a residency, and the, the re-encounter with Delfino was, was seeing Delfino up in a mountain, digging holes with people in their 70s, you know, men in their 70s, planting agaves, because they were the ones that came up with the system to start reforesting with agaves to, to slow the erosion. So what you're gonna see is the system that they've created. It's a system that started with a little bit of government funding, but the problem with government programs is that there's always strings attached, and uh, they're very short-sighted. The money runs out very quickly, and this is exactly what happened here. So, so this is when I saw an opportunity to start working together and to find another system to to keep funding this, this, this effort, but you'll, you'll see it here. The switch to this foreign system had devastating consequences in the village. The weed killers were the worst as they eradicated most of the wild shrubs. This caused a vicious cycle of erosion, which turned once fertile fields into desolate deserts. This used to be a cornfield. The topsoil has been washed away, leaving only rocks behind. Nothing grows here anymore. This is a digital representation of these mountains using topographic satellite data that helps us visualize the flow of water down the hillsides. Without wild plants retaining the soil with the roots, there is no stopping the water during the monsoon season. Our solution is to look back to indigenous terracing agriculture, to create physical barriers to slow the water. This is where agaves come into play as they are the only local plant that can withstand the heat and poor soil quality of the area. By digging a trench and planting an agave by its side, we can achieve water and soil retention. Since 2015, we have been digging hundreds of trenches, and we have planted thousands of agaves of different varieties. 45,000 to be precise. The idea here is to plant the agaves along the trenches, which are spaced out every 50 meters and are leveled. This turns the trenches into small pools that filter the water through the bedrock, replenishing the water table and the wells needed for farming. The long-term goal is to retain enough soil and water to allow for the wild plants to come back. It might seem strange to call this, but what we are doing is actually reforestation. It's all about finding local solutions to regenerate the land. But in order to see the scale of this project, you have to take to the sky. This viewpoint really shows the magnitude of our efforts. It's a beautiful thing to see those green lines we created crisscrossing the mountains 
and of course to see the beginnings of new growth. So far we have covered 120 hectares, but there's still so much more to do. I really see this as a lifelong project. Yeah, so I mean, it's uh, you know we we planted yeah close to close to fifty thousand uh, plants, but what's really nice is only after a, f a couple of years they start to multiply. So I mean, it's uh, it's hard to calculate how many there are there, but you know what you can see is is all of these little trees that are coming back um, because what what agaves are they're essentially pioneer plants. They start to create the right conditions in the soil to invite all of these uh, local shrubs, basically, to come back. And th these are the ones that start to hold the soil as well. Um, another sort of unintended consequence, that, that a positive consequence, is that most of them, because we planted them at the same time, they all started to flower at the same time. And I don't know if you've seen the, the flower of an agave. Basically, they, they flower towards the end of their life, about five to seven years down after planting. And... Um, the main pollinators for these flowers are bats. So because you all of a sudden had tens of thousands of flowers, you had a whole new colony of bats that came to the area. And, and these bats are now uh, basically feasting on all the insects that were plaguing the corn. So, so it's really nice to see how both of the projects are working together. There's more water in the wells. The bats are eating the, the, the bugs. And the community is, is, is both doing marketry and doing fibers, you know? So, so it's, a, yeah, it's a bit of a virtuous circle where everything connects and works together. So, all right, I'm gonna focus the last 15 minutes or so of my presentation into my latest project, uh, which was just presented in December in the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. Uh, this is a, a really long research project that I started in 2018. And uh, it's called Conflict Avocados, and it's looking at the sort of dark side of the avocado trade uh, in Mexico, but in relationship to the rest of the world. So avocado, again, you know, if you notice, like most of my materials are, are super iconic Mexican staples, you know, uh, corn, agave, and avocado. And avocado, again, is another plant that was domesticated in Mexico, uh, that was a sacred plant. Um, it was revered in offerings since, you know, before the Aztecs were even around. Uh, we have tens of different kinds of, of avocados. Some of them you can eat with, your, with their skin on. Uh, they're like butter, you know. Some of them don't have pits. They're really, they look like cucumbers. There's loads of them. Um, but the, the avocado is also a plant that has gone immense modifications, you know. And probably the most dramatic one is the the creation of the Haas avocado. So the Haas avocado was created by this man that you see in the picture, Rudolf Haas, who was actually a, a mailman in California, but he was an amateur horticulturalist, really bright man, that uh, basically managed to create one tree in his backyard, which you see still in his house in, in, in California. Um, and this tree produced a really hardy avocado with a really thick skin that could travel really well um, and, um, and the Haas just completely took off uh, in the second half of the 20th century because it was so well designed for being packaged and shipped. Uh, the rest of the avocados, you know, you, you, you can't take them very far, but the, the Haas you can. So again, <laughs> NAFTA was the detonator between uh, the trade between Mexico and first the United States and then the rest of the world. Prior to 1994, uh, there was a total ban on the trade of avocados between b the borders. Uh, this was mostly due to a lobby by the California growers because they, they didn't want to have uh, you know, competition with the growers of Michoacan where, where the best avocados come from. Um, so the argument was that there was a plague in Michoacan, that, that, well, in, in Mexico that could spread to California. And miraculously, this plague was... Uh, abolished, you know, right before the signing of the treaty. So, so there was, uh, they say that the, the, the big trade-off was uh, Mexico relaxed the rules with the importation of corn in exchange of the states opening the borders to avocados as well. Uh, so it's really interesting to see how, you know, the, the, the research of both projects also, also converges in this one moment. Um, but the only state that got the approval to export is Michoacán, only Michoacán, only one state. 
And Michoacán produces 52% of all the avocados of the world and nine out of 10 of the avocados that you consume here. So it's all coming from one region. Um, for me, it was also really interesting to understand what caused the, 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 the peak of consumption in, in avocados, you know, and, and, and it was really interesting to see that actually prior to the early 2000s, uh, very few people were eating avocados. Some people didn't even know that it existed, you know, certainly in, in places like Europe. I mean, I remember when I arrived in London, like, no one ate avocados, and it was impossible to get them in supermarkets. This is in 2007, 2008. So um, one of the, the main pushes for, for, for people to start eating avocados came from within the producers. There's a, there's a union of producers in Michoacán. They all got together and almost went bankrupt uh, to, put, to put all of their savings together to book the most expensive ad in the Super Bowl halftime show in, in, in the early 2000s. And uh, it completely worked. It basically created this sort of new tradition of eating guacamole on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, this company called Avocados from Mexico was created. And, uh, and that's what started to roll out the, the sale of avocados into most of the American supermarkets. Um, so uh, I did a documentary, and so these are little clips that I'm going to show you from the documentary that we produced. So I got access to one of the biggest factories uh, that pack avocados in Uruapan, Michoacán. Uh, this one factory, when we were filming in that afternoon, managed to pack 650 tons, so 650,000 kilos of avocados. And when you look at each of these avocados, think about how much they cost in the supermarket here. So you can start to get a calculator out about how much money that is. No hay otro negocio ni la droga que te dé ese, esa utilidad tan fuerte, donde inviertes 10 y ganas 100, es impresionante, y con muy poco trabajo. Y desde ahí se empezó a nombrar como, como el, oro, el oro verde, porque pues era encontrar una mina, pues nomás llegas a, a sacar. So like a, like a gold rush, it's exactly that, you know, and... Um... This huge demand globally, what, what, is, what it's pushing people in, in Michoacán to do is, is to basically go in and, and, and cut forests. Um, and this is particularly problematic in Michoacán because Michoacán is one of the most uh, precious places in Mexico in terms of biodiversity. You know, it goes from the coast where you have tropical jungles to all the way to the highlands where you have pine forests, I mean, like, like in Canada, you know. And um, Michoacán is also host to one of the most impressive uh, migration uh, phenomenons in the world. It's the, the, the nesting site for the North American monarch butterfly. So all of the monarchs of North America, of Canada, of the United States, of, of, that are spread out in all of these North American forests, basically fly and funnel in to Michoacán. No one really knows how or why they go to the same forest every single year and how they all know how to do it. Uh, but what's really impressive is that not a single one of these butterflies has been there before. So it's just, it's just incredible. And not only can they go to one forest, but they arrive always in the 1st of November, which coincides with the Mexican Day of the Dead. So for people in Michoacán, there's this, also this wonderful superstition about them being the, 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 the dead relatives that are visiting you. Um, it's, it's really, I think, you know, I'm not, I'm not religious, but I think this is one of the most sort of like spiritual experiences that I've ever had. You know, you're walking in this forest and it's just, they're all over you, they're all around you. It's, it's, it's insane. Um, I was telling Tim that when, when I was there uh, the first time filming for research, I remember hearing this big crack in one of these branches that was that thick that broke under the weight of like millions of butterflies that were, you know, on the, on the, on the tree branch. So it's just super impressive. But it is a forest that is in peril. Um, out of this nesting area of the monarch, uh, between 1994 and the, and the year 2000, 44% of that was cut down. Um, which coincides with that big spike in, 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 the, in the avocado consumption. So these are maps of, of what's supposed to be the protected areas of, of these forests. And by the way, this is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's supposed to not be touched at all, you know? So you have the, the, the clear green, uh, the, the, the lighter green, which is what's supposed to be a buffer area to protect the, the core forest, and the, the green area is the corn forest. And all the rest of the, the red and the yellow has been the deforestation that has happened within the super protected area, you know. So uh, 
the most sort of dramatic effect of why this is a huge problem came in 2002. And uh, this is a testimony by um, Jose Luis Alvarez, who, is, uh, who has a foundation that has helped to reforest the, the, the area. Uh, but it's better if you hear from him. In 2002, por la tal clandestina y racional, lo que sucedió es lo siguiente, donde invernan la mariposa monarca, tiene que ser un bosque cerrado, así. Okay. Lo que pasó aquí es que como talaron, se abrió el bosque. ¿Ves estos huecos entre mis dedos? Entonces, cuando comenzó a nevar y helar, pues naturalmente, como no era el bosque cerrado, entró la, la nieve, entró el hielo y congeló a las mariposas, ¿verdad? Fueron millones de mariposas que murieron. ¿no? Hay una fotografía donde estoy hasta las rodillas en, en mariposas. ¿no? A la semana o dos semanas ya olía horrible, ¿no? La putrefacción de que se estaban descomponiendo las mariposas. ¿no? Proteger la naturaleza tiene un peligro, ¿verdad? Pero si existe este peligro es porque existe una cantidad fabulosa de dinero que se puede ganar. Pues un ambientalista, que sea en México, que sea en África, que sea donde sea, siempre va a tener el peligro de una confrontación con gente muy, muy poderosa. So, there was estimated that about 72 million butterflies died that night, and, and, and that represented more than 80% of the total population of the North American monarchs. Um, just by chance, part of the colony went to a lower area that was more protected. But uh, biologists estimate that there was a really good chance that we could have lost the whole species in one night with one freezing, you know? So these forests are just, are just they cannot be lost, you know? Uh, and, 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 and we must do everything in our power to protect it. Um, I have been documenting uh, the, the monarch uh, phenomenon since 2018. Uh, again, I, I've tried to go every single year, and, and, and you can tell, I mean, they are declining every year. Every year you see less. Every year they have to go higher up in the mountain to look for the colder parts of the forest because the forests are just thinning down, and you see the avocado grows just all around. Um, so this whole project started because uh, my wife, uh, next to me there, is a journalist for the BBC, and, and uh, I sometimes help her uh, illustrate her pieces uh, with photo and video. And uh, in, in, in this, she was doing a piece on this man, Omero Gomez. Uh, Omero was the, the leader of the sanctuary of the butterflies, the president of the sanctuary, and, and a really key person uh, to spearhead all of the uh, community initiatives for reforestation, uh, but he was also a very powerful sort of local politician that, that was really uh, making a link, an important link between the federal government and the local community uh, to get support, to convince people to not log, to, to, to see, to, for people to see a future also in ecotourism and protecting the butterfly and protecting the, the forest. Um, but unfortunately that uh, put him in enormous danger. And uh, unfortunately, he, he was killed in, in 2020, in uh, January, uh, right before we were getting ready to do a second interview with him. Um, and I think for me, that was, I mean, a very big personal blow, but it also was a big sort of eye-opener to the fact that, you know, the issue is not as simple as we're eating too many avocados and therefore we're wiping out natural habitat and that might affect the monarchs. No, there's, it's, it's, it's a big factor of people in between, and, and, and people are dying, and people that are protecting these environments are dying. So how can we start to even think about protecting this uh, natural heritage if we can't even ensure the security to the people protecting these areas? So that really started to make me focus on the human factor, and it took me to Cheran. Uh, Cheran is a an amazing example of how uh, a, a community basically rebelled to protect their forest. And this was all started by this one woman called Josefina Estrada that you see here. Um, and this is her testimony. Secuestraban gente, la amarraban, la asustaban, tumbaban al pino, se lo llevaban, y nosotros éramos libres de traer un leño. Porque iban quemando ya después. 
y mucha gente pues asustada. Es el bosque. Al rato van a ser las mujeres. Tenían miedo. Por eso el señor cura decía que ya no había hombres. Que aquí ya no había hombres en la comunidad. Y si era cierto. ¿Por qué? Porque no querían enfrentarse. Le hablamos al ejército de Zamora. Al ejército de Morelia y nadie quiso apoyarnos. No podíamos hablar. No era justo pues ya lo que nos estaban haciendo. Y por eso decidimos levantarnos. Yo lo que hice son unos papelitos. Nada más se me vino a mi mente, ya va a ser compañero. Es hora de levantarnos. En comedia de la mañana, cuando empezaron a tocar las campanas, los cuates eran malísimos. Palos, piedras. Era lo que traían los nombres. Un carro lo detuvimos a las ocho y media de la mañana. Ese fue el primero. Jamás andaba solo el hombre ese, lo bajamos y según lo amarramos, pues no teníamos ni lazos, no estábamos pues ni prevenidos, nada. Lo amarramos con el rebozo, el primero en la puerta del templo. Fueron cinco los que detuvimos. Ya después empezaron a quemar los carros. No nos importó pasar a lo que pasaron o que nos pasara a nosotros como mujeres, ¿no? No le tuvimos miedo. Gracias a Dios a los compañeros, no sé cómo lo hicieron. En las barricadas se movieron, hicieron, deshicieron, pero la comunidad estaba al pendiente. Pero nunca se me va a olvidar. So I think the, the story of Charan, I mean, is, is sort of a, a very powerful story about what's happening in, in, in the whole uh, state. There's just so much money being made by Avocado that um, you know, there's local gangs, there's more serious organized crime, there's even just farmers invading other uh, terrains to, to chop uh, the forest down to grow avocados because, you know, you can sell the wood uh, one time and uh, if you plant wood again, you don't get harvested until like maybe 20 years down the line, but if you plant avocados, you can be uh, getting avocados after three years. Um, So uh, the story of Cheran is, is a really powerful one because it shows the unity of, of, of a community to defend their forest and to not only engage in that first act of violence, but then to, to organize and to reframe their whole way of life uh, for a sustainable system um, that has so far lasted more than 10 years. The, they had the revolt in 2011. Um, and I think one of the, 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 the really uh, important decisions that they made was that Uh, you know, what's really interesting about them is that they managed to get uh, a pardon from, well, a negotiation with the federal government to allow them, because they are indigenous people, to self-govern. So Cheran is a completely autonomous state uh, where all political parties are banned, where they have their own guard to, to patrol their forests. Um, and uh, they have reforested nine million trees since, since 2011. Uh, every member of the community has to do a day of community service a week to go and plant forests. Um, and something that is really uh, amazing is that they have a total ban on avocados. Like if you get caught going into Charan with an avocado tree, you get into major, major trouble, you know? Um, so there's a sign that they have at the entrance of, of the town. Uh, where, you know, the situation is still tense. You can see the bullet holes in there, but, um, but basically they, they, they have a, a, a total ban on avocados and they have a community uh, patrol that is patrolling the forest to ensure that no one cuts the trees. And the, the, the results of their efforts is really clear. The, the, the image on the right is, is the reforested forest of Charan. And, 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 and you see the division with the next town where everything that you see there is small avocado trees that had just been planted. And that's the case in all four directions around the forest. So uh, for me, it was you know, thinking about this image of Josefina talking about using her textiles as a rope uh, really inspired me to create a big textile piece that would be inspired by the tapestry of Bayeux, uh, which is a, a medieval masterpiece that traces the invasion of, of the Normans to Great Britain. And it follows this sort of very linear storytelling uh, where all the characters are, are, are saying something. And, and I got inspired by that by, to create my own version of, 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 of this, uh, the women's revolts using nothing but firecracker stones and sticks. Um, and how they have 
created this new sort of um, utopia, basically. So the result is a textile piece that is 40 meters in length by, by three in height. I think that's 400, 400 feet in length, something like that. It's very long. Um, and each of these pieces is made, uh, well, you'll see. So this is in my studio in Mexico City. And this is all ties with avocado pits. So the avocado pits have something called tannins that makes these sort of pinkish, brownish colors. So for months, we were just collecting avocados from a guacamole vendor, all of his waste in the market next to the studio. We had a sort of like an illustrator master file uh, that we traced. We, you know, separated in, in, in little parts and pieces. Every little part got numbered um, and cut from different pieces of the cloth. So the tapestry of Bayeux took, I think, 150 years to be finished. Uh, ours took a year and a half, but you know, it's, <laughs> it's a modest effort. And we used a lot of uh, articles from real newspapers from the time, you know, to illustrate the story as well. And half of the, of the tapestry focuses on Charam, but the other half focuses on the sort of millennial obsession, you know, on the other side. Um, and, and it connects these two stories of, of, of of the global story with the local story within one textile piece, the Super Bowl, uh, you know, etc. So we, you know, because it was such a massive piece, we had to work in it in sections. So we created our own loom in the workshop that, you know, we would work on the individual characters on the on the machines. But then we had to like hand stitch everything in this big sort of DIY loom that we created. Um, we also created a, a sort of new marketry material with the skins of the avocados. And with that, uh, you know, it's, I would describe it something between leather and, I don't know, a veneer. Um, and with that, we made this credenza. Um, it's, a, it's a really sort of impressive piece just because when you think like each one of these squares is an avocado. Um, you know, and uh, and uh, I also created this piece which was inspired by Japanese boro. So using all the, all the offcuts of the, of the big textile, um, I started to do this patchwork pattern um, inspired by Japanese boro. Boro is a technique where you would use patchwork to repair broken textiles or workwear, you know? So you would start to patch these holes and over time you would patch them so much that it would be a, a, kind of like a new piece. And so for me, it was a, a nice uh, sort of idea to create uh, my own borrow, um, which would maybe, thinking about this idea of repair, you know, could hint at, at the repair of a broken system. Um, so this is a piece called Resting Place. It's done in honor uh, of Homero. Uh, I wanted to give it a little bit of a sort of like funerary uh, aesthetic, it was a sarcophagus of coffin almost. Um, and yeah, this is a piece that is in honor of Homero. Uh, this video is something that I did uh, about a week after I heard of his death. And uh, with the permission of his family, I basically took a lot of the audios of his Facebook recordings where he would invite tourists to come and see the, the, the sanctuary. And in this, uh, in this videos, you know, when you're in the, in the sanctuary, you have to speak really low. You know, you have to kind of whisper to not uh, upset the butterflies. So, so I felt it was such an intimate, um, sort of narration of, of him in, in, in the forest. And so we, I, I isolated all of these uh, audio and, and paired it with some of the images that I created that day when I met him. And this is a, a short video of it. Está viviendo una gran locura de la mariposa monarca donde millones vuelan y vuelan por todos lados, en el cielo. Mira qué hermoso. Algo maravilloso. ¿A qué son de duermen? Las viajeras. Las polinizadoras.
Hoy vuela y vuela por todos los senderos. Buscando agua. Mira, más que bendición, buscando agua, buscando flores. Aquí en el santuario el rosario es más grande y hermoso del mundo. Hoy se viste de naranja el cielo. He was a, an amazing speaker, very poetic. Um, so, I guess to finish this uh, this presentation of the project before I go to my conclusions, you know, when I was in, in Australia presenting the, the the project, and 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 you know, I I knew that the, the question was going to be, well, sh should we stop eating avocado altogether? And I, I don't think that's the solution, you know. I mean, uh, the avocado industry also creates a, a huge amount of jobs. It's a very complex problem, and I think it's not about stopping eating something altogether. I think it's about moderation. And when I was thinking about moderation and self-restraint, um, I was thinking of something that I learned in school when I was a, a child in Mexico. We were learning about the Aztecs, and um, there's this sort of story about how Hernán Cortés, the Spanish conquistador, uh, got greeted in Moctezuma's palace, and... Um, he got served uh, such a feast, and, and him and his whole court were so impressed by the fact that they had you know, fresh fish from the Gulf and fruits from, uh, from the jungles in the south of Mexico and you know, deer that was hunted in the mountains of Michoacan, and they had such, like, this big system of runners that would literally run with a fish you know, uh, and sprint and do relays to bring him his fish every day. And when you think about it, we are all eating like Aztec emperors today, you know, and the world cannot sustain that. Um, so for my conclusions, you know, I would like to say that indigenous communities must be included in sustainability policymaking decisions because they are the least responsible for the climate crisis, yet they are the first ones to suffer from it. They are victims of uh, the negative effects of globalization while being excluded from its advantages. Um, for me, the, the, the projects are always a platform as well to, to, to bring more attention to these people. So I think one, one of the, um, the pinnacles of, of, of the project is that uh, I got in, invited to the World Economic Forum uh, you know, in Davos where all the heads of states get together and the big industrialists and you know, somewhere in the mix there's also Greta Thunberg and, 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 and some of the environmentalists. But um, it's really a conference about commerce and trade and, and industry. And, um, you know, I convinced them to actually give part of the allocated time for Delfino to speak. Um, so it was uh, an amazing opportunity. The first time that he traveled outside of Mexico, uh, the first time that an indigenous Mexican was included in the conference. And uh, it, was, it was really nice, not only to see that he was being heard over there, but that he felt important and he felt listened. And I think a big part of uh, what we try to do is is to you know, give confidence back to these people that have been told for decades that the way of life is backwards, that they're against progress, that that's not the way to go. Um, so for me as well, the goal is not sustainability anymore because we've gone through the point of just sustaining our current resources. For me, we have to go beyond that uh, and, and think more about regeneration. And I also think that we can't solve the climate crisis without addressing the inequality crisis. I don't think cha things will change if the only way out of extreme poverty is to decimate natural resources. Again, if you have a little bit of forest behind your house and you can't afford healthcare for your children and you say, okay, I'm gonna cut it down and plant avocados, anyone would do it, you know? It's, it's not only about organized crime, it's about poverty. So I think um, we can't uh, narrow this gap of inequality without dealing with the ghosts of our colonial past. And I think designers can play a major role in proposing radically new production systems that are fair. Um, we also have to remember that the environmental crisis is a man-made crisis. And I actually don't think that we should forget about human-centered design. You know, there's this big kind of push to move away from human-centered design and to focus more on nature-centered design. But we are part of nature. And, and, and nature's fine. And it's, I, I see it more of a, of a problem of humans against humans. So I think we, we, we should still be uh, centered in human-centered design, but we need to diversify who we are designing for. Thank you.
Thank you. So we have some time for questions, and um, I would ask you to please raise your hand, and staff will bring a microphone to you. Elizabeth. Hi there, um, my name is Mari, but first of all, thank you so much, Fernando, for giving us such an inspirational talk. Um, I, as, as an undergraduate student right now, senior who is graduating, I really appreciate just the way that you're incorporating nature and um, finding a sustainable way of um, material design. Um, I'm currently taking classes for that right now, sustainability and biodesign, and uh, I was really interested in just how to, how are you finding your team members? How are you talking to, um, uh, reaching out to all these indigenous uh, communities and just like the nature of how, how the collaboration works, um, how the researchers are, um, are the ecologists involved? Like who are involved in your teams and your, in your research and in your production? Mm -hmm. um, well, in the case of Tonawisla, it started because of this childhood uh, connection with Delfino, and um, I think without that, it would have been extremely hard to do it. Uh, in a way, um, we are in a bit of a privileged position because Delfino is now the community leader. Uh, something I forgot to mention in the presentation is that uh, Tonawisla operates as a communally owned uh, land, basically. No one is owner of their house or their parcels, they all own it communally. And so they all come up with decisions of how uh, their town is going to operate through what's called an indigenous assembly. It's the, the same case with Cheran, for example. So um, I, I don't really have like a method of doing it. I think for me it's more like you go there, you show up, and you take it slow. You know, I mean, I think, uh, with the avocado project, I started in 2018, you know, and, and meeting the rangers that day uh, made me meet one of the people working in one of the nurseries that were helping them reforest there, and he was one of the main actors in the reforestation project in Cheran. So through him, I got introduced to Cheran, and I, I think it's like that. It's, it's, I mean, it's a bit like business, you know. You, you're not going to show up to a corporation and just be like, hey, you know, you need a, you need a presentation and you need to convince one person first. Um, but yeah, I think, I think if, you, if you, my advice would be if, if you want to work with a community, no matter what kind of community, I would say first arrive with a lot of questions and no answers and take a lot of notes and understand exactly what they are telling you and, and, and then maybe start suggesting things. It's a bit like dating, you know? You, you can't just lean in for a kiss on the first date. Or, or <laughs> Audrey. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. I really see your deep relationship with these materials and how you're transforming them into another object. I'm really curious about the market for these objects. You can create the coolest object ever, but how are you bringing money back to, to the village? What, what is the like, retail for your objects? Um, so, uh I started with Tatomoxle uh, very much focusing on, on the sort of collectible design uh, market, gallery pieces basically. Um, that's for two reasons. I, when I was in London, I worked for studios that were in that world, you know, so I, I, I knew that world and I know how, they, how it works and I had some connections there. But also because our materials are so scarce at the beginning, and uh, our techniques, you know, are not the most effective when you start. So, you know, for example, when we started Toto Moxley, I think it would take us maybe, it would take a whole team of 10 people a whole day to barely make a square meter, you know? And, and now, now we can make, I don't know, 10, 15 square meters a day. So, um, if you have very limited uh, material, if you have very big labor cost, the worst thing you can do is start making beer coasters and try to sell them, you know, by the tens. Uh, so it's really about focusing about what, on what's going to give you the most revenue for 
uh, that limited and precious material, you know? And, and I think this is when uh, you can find great allies in, in, in gallerists and curators in museums uh, that will be appreciating uh, not only the piece, but the story behind it and, and, your, and your story, you know? It's, um, it's a model that has worked with me, and, and um, I think it also helps on the sustainability side of things because we, we actually make very few pieces a year, you know? Like, I, I don't think we make more than 20, 30 pieces a year in my studio. Uh, it takes us, you know, two to three months to make a piece. So um, I think the idea is to make really special pieces that almost become heirlooms to your clients and collectors, things that get passed down to their children, things that are not going to be thrown away straight away. And that allows you to put really good craftsmanship behind these projects, you know. So, so that's, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's how I do it normally. I think we have a person here. Elizabeth, in the front. Hi, just wanted to say thank you for your wonderful presentation. Um, I think my number one question is, you have so many um, things that you do throughout your practice, um, your, your research and your community <coughs> outreach, and um, I'm just curious, how would you personally describe your role like as a designer like in like in a sentence or like a few words what do you think like um let's how, how do i want to say this um you have so many different things that that inspire you and that you are trying to achieve what is your number one way that you mm -hmm. describe i i would say um it's more of a of a connector you know, a, a connector of groups. Um, and I think that's, that's something that design can really give you, you know, like you, you're this sort of fluid character that can speak to a farmer, but can also speak to a gallerist and, and you know, um, or to a politician or whatever. And I think for design, you, you need this big, very big toolbox of skills, you know, that, that can push you in different directions. And certainly, you know, you get really good at, at pitching things when you're studying design, you know, so, so I definitely kept that from my design education, you know, it was, I remember the first time that I had a meeting with the Indigenous Assembly in Tono Weeks line, and, and I had a presentation, you know, and I, and I was like, I pitched to them, essentially, so, um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, I would describe it as a, as a connector uh, of, of groups that would otherwise never make contact. That's a really wonderful way to describe mm, it. That's you. really cool. Thank you. Audrey. Uh, well, thank you for your talk. Like everyone said, I think it was a really moving uh, conversation that you had here. Uh, my question was in the first project, especially because you just spoke of yourself as a designer and a connector between different groups. Uh, it was interesting to see how you connected with the community of farmers or craftspeople, uh, and you described yourself as the designer in that project. I was curious if you think that there's, um, like you consider members of the community to be designers as well, and if there's any flow between those different roles, and whether you think it's important for that to be the case as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm opening this file because it's not in my presentation, but I think it will help you answer the question. Um, so this is this is one of my latest pieces uh, that I presented in the gallery in September, and this color, uh, as you can tell, you know, this is quite different color palette from the other images that you saw that are more purple and more brown. So that color came because the farmers decided to cross pollinate two varieties of corn. So they took their, their sort of star uh, corns, you know, a red one and a white one. Those were the ones that would grow the best. And without me telling them anything, uh, they did this thing where they put bags over one corn uh, when they're about to, to release their pollen. They trap all the pollen, and they take those bags to the other corn that, that, that grows a little bit slower and dump all of that pollen on the, on the other corn. And by combining these two, you have a hybrid, you have a baby out of these two corns. And that sort of peachy color um, is, is a new color 
that they effectively biodesigned out of their own initiative, you know. So I see this piece um, as the first 50-50 co-designed piece, you know, where, where I, I, I did not ask them for a new color, they came up with it. And this is them really showing skills that I would never have. Uh, and it's this amazing sort of ability to understand plants that I think only indigenous people have, you know. Elizabeth. <coughs> Hi, um, I was wondering what you'd suggest for us to um, practice sustainability or help out what you're trying to do. To practice sustainability? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the thing is sustainability is such a broad umbrella, you know, so you could approach it from a really, in my opinion, superficial way, you know, just saying, okay, I'm using materials that are compostable or are degradable or are recyclable. That's a great way to start. But I think, again, I think we have to go beyond that and really start thinking about uh, all the ramifications of something, you know. So I guess my advice would be just become an expert of something, you know. Don't be that vague uh, because I think... I think for, for true change to happen, you, you need more and more people, young people especially, engaged in this, you know. And I think for me it's, it's not really, uh, you know, the environmental crisis is not going to be solved by a big government or a group of big companies, uh, you know, coming up with a new way of doing things. I think it's going to be small initiatives like mine perhaps on a multiplicity, you know, like creating a network of, of nodules that that start to, to create a net almost. Um, you know, I'm thinking, I, I graduated from Central St. Martins with 100 students in my class, you know, and, and 90 something of them are doing branding, are doing, you know, very corporate stuff. And I know that that's the way, you know, things work. But, but I think if, you know, per class you have one or two people uh, dedicating their life's work to a particular environment and solving a particular issue, uh, that has a major ripple effect, you know, and, and, and you know, I would encourage you to, to just be curious and to create the right situation for you to be, to have the sensibility to locate a problem like this and to, you know, really say, okay, in the next decade, I'm going to focus on that, you know. I hope it's okay. I have a second question. Um, yeah. <laughs> what can we do to help out what you're doing? Um, I mean, you can come to an internship, or you can visit the community. Um, yeah. Sorry? <laughs> yeah, I take people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Audrey? Hi, um, I was really interested in the ways that you're talking about labor and the people that you're working with and also in the way that you shared this piece, talking about the shared design concept that without them designing this corn or creating this corn, working together with this corn, you couldn't create this piece. How are you considering authorship, um, community, and also just the, the labor and compensation of those people who I think at the beginning you described that some of them come in and they, they work when they want, mm -hmm. and you have simple ways of training them. What, what does that look like in your studio? Mm. Well, so we have two studios, one that is in, the, in Mexico City and, uh, and the other one in the countryside. So in the countryside, we have a, a daily fee for, for their work, uh, no matter what they do, and it's about four times the minimum wage. Um, so... That's how we remunerate them. Um, we also pay them, we, 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 we pay a lot of stuff for them to prepare the land, for example, you know. So we, we give them a first sort of deposit to the families. Uh, for example, the ones that maybe don't want to come and work in the, in the workshop. Um, they get a first investment at the beginning of the season to prepare the land, to, you know, purchase manure from the animals, to hire, uh, they still use bulls and plow, but that still costs money, you know, to prepare the land. We give them the seeds. 
Uh, we pay them again to to do the thing with the little machines, you know, to separate the the, the leaves. And um, yeah, and we sometimes buy grain if they if they have a surplus grain that they want to sell, and we help them, you know, uh, place it somewhere else. Um, to be honest, you know, there's a lot of people that don't care that much about money, you know? Like, I mean, the ones that don't come to the, to the, to the workshop, they're like, you know what, I, I'm fine now. Like, I don't want to be... There's a guy in particular that is, like, allergic to being indoors, you know? Like, he just, he just wants to be out all day. Um, and in the, you know, in the, in the studio in the city, it, 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 I mean, that operates more like a traditional studio, so it depends on their roles, and there's a, you know, there's a clear sort of ladder that you go up, and, and wages are determined by that. But the, the studio in Mexico City has everything. I mean, right now we have, a, we have a, a girl from Hong Kong, we have a girl from Holland, uh, we have, uh, our team is comprised of people that are, for example, we have two of the, the daughters of the farmers that are there uh, that decided to move to the city. Um, we have designers, we have people that have worked in fab labs. So it's a very mixed team, you know, and, 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 and the wages sort of reflect that in a way. We have time for one more question. I, um, I just noticed personally in my own development as a young artist that I've had some trouble managing what I have to do and what I want to do um, professional-wise. And I wanted to ask if you could speak on the early stages of your career and how you managed um, working in someone else's studio, especially in a space that might have been more traditional or even like corporate, for lack of a better word. Um, while still pursuing your own growth and what you were actually passionate about. Yeah. Um, well, this is in London, and I, I talked about this yesterday, but basically this is... Uh, I graduated during the financial crisis, um, so there were no corporate jobs. So, so I started to intern and volunteer my time while I was still studying uh, to independent studios, small studios, you know, with a single person and now with their personal assistant and I would do everything. And for example, the marquetry I learned from this wonderful designer, Bethan Wood, that learned the marquetry from Martino Gamper, that learned the marquetry from, you know, so there was like a whole lineage of people working with veneers uh, and each of us have modulated it into their own uh, technique. Um, I mean, I think it's perfectly normal to struggle a lot at the beginning, you know? And uh, for me, it was just inconceivable to go and work with a corporate client, you know, or a corporate uh, um, yeah, institution. So uh, I was working in pubs. I was, uh, you know, doing really shit carpentry jobs, but... Uh, you know, every time I would, I would work in the studio or I would do freelance work, um, I would invoice, and in the invoice I would include a tool, uh, a woodworking tool or a press or uh, something, you know. And so I very slowly started to accumulate enough machines to put together a little workshop. And uh, that's how I started to create my first pieces. But, I mean, just as, as reference, you know, I started these projects when I was 26, and I don't think I can say I was living off them until I was maybe 30. And uh, I started Toto Moxley with an investment of maybe $1,000. So it can be done. You just have to be patient, you know. And I think this is a big thing. Like, this is a theme that runs through all my factories. Uh, it's, it's patience. You can't rush these things, you know. Uh, and to talk about regeneration... You can't just say that you're, you're in a project about regeneration without showing results. So until you have a before and after of a regenerated area, it's almost like speculation or, or I'm working towards that, you know. And this is something that I would encourage every young person here to think about, you know, the uh, sort of need for the immediacy of success. I think it's perfectly time to take your time, and you should take your time. Thank you.